they have only basically one key requirement that, that there should be a course in scientific methodology, but otherwise it's uh, the requirement is that it says that you should take courses in this particular subject and that particular subject. But exactly which courses they are, but that's up to the advisor and student to decide. So it's very, very much on the basis. Um, so, um, um, one requirement, though, is, is important that the courses that are taken, they have to be, the majority of the courses have to be on the, on the third cycle level. So it should be advanced, uh, not advanced level courses, but PhD level courses, which are stepped above the, the master course. You can take some master courses uh, in, in your PhD or licensee, but uh, the majority of the courses, as I said, 60% of the courses have to be at the, at the PhD level. Um, if you look at the study social environment of the student, the, um, our, our, the normal situation that uh, is now required from KK is that students are employed by the department. So students have a full-time employment and, and all the social benefits uh, go with that. So you have you pay for your pension and, and, uh, and you have sort of full medical insurance and everything is... Uh, it's um, nice. Uh, it's usually combined with the uh, the construction is usually an eighty percent research assistant where you do your studies and the twenty percent teach, teaching assistantship because that's the way how the uh, how the employment is financed. So you typically the student uh, teaches for about twenty percent of his time, or, or is involved in other departments. But if some students. Uh, take care of our web page or, or some students uh, help develop uh, laboratory exercises or, or maybe do some experiments uh, for, for, some, for some projects. So they, they, they are, I wouldn't say necessarily it's teaching it, but it's department is due to the, is the um, formal construction. And uh, if you have this 20%, 80%, this means that your normal study time is you're allowed to, to do work after five years. Normally it's, normally it's a four-year program, but if you have this combined construction, you're, you're allowed to go on for five years. Um, how much actually spent by the students to, to take the degree varies, of course, very much from the subject and very individual. But there are students that finish in, in less than three years, less than, yeah, four, definitely less than four years, but very rarely students finish quicker than three and a half years. So five years is more seen as a, as a upper limit. I don't know, know exactly what the average study time is, but I think it's somewhere uh, between around four and a half years or something like that, because most students have this discipline part. Um, some other good news is there's no tuition fee for, uh, for students, uh, for, for any students, neither uh, Swedish nor European nor students from outside. Also, so, so, the uh, tuition fee um, uh, that is now in, in, in introduced for the master program in undergrad education is not applicable to the tuition program. So that's sort of the, the, um, the basic uh, prerequisite. Some students um, uh, are still enrolled under another regime which is um, uh, that was previously used and that was uh, uh, having getting a stipend, for instance, if your if your home country uh, gives you a stipend to study at the PhD program, uh, so you, in that case you don't get any salary from from the from the from KGH. But that is something that KGH is trying to get get rid of because the uh, uh, come back a little bit to what are the limiting factors for for us at KGH. And um, how do you get admitted? If you think this is a good good thing, uh, how do you get admitted? Um, uh, well, admission is done practically only in uh, competition, in uh, in KGH common calls. So there, are about five to six times a year, KGH makes uh, uh, an announcement that uh, now there you can apply for uh, PhD uh, positions, and then. All the departments that have uh, openings are required to put in their their uh, ads into one of these slots. So usually, there's, there's a bunch of uh, 
open positions in different subjects. Normally, the call uh, says that there is now a open position in energy efficient uh, wireless networks, for instance, the PhD position in energy efficient wireless networks. So, uh, so that the ad is already very well specified because, the, uh, <clears throat> as you know, as I said, there the, are employments involved in it, and employments have to be financed. So normally the, the financing comes from different research projects. So a department has now uh, got, fun, got its research project funded, and then we can employ PhD students on that. If you look at the formal requirements that we need, uh, formal requirements are um, uh, that you um, need a master science degree or something equivalent. It says at least 240 credits. And it has to be um, or equivalent. So normally we say it has to be a degree equivalent to the master's degree here at KTH. So and that's, of course, a discussion that if you have a degree from another university, then uh, is that equivalent or not? And, uh, we have the experts at the um, uh, uh, university, at the um, uh, like the Hurst School of Service, the uh, administration for, for universities in Sweden that can make this equivalence uh, uh, certification saying that okay, this is a well known university and this has this degree corresponds to it. In this. Normally, if you make this equivalent uh, testing, you, you, you should check would this degree in your home country, would that qualify you for PhD studies in your home country? That's basically what it's going to do. Um, so that's the, what is called the general uh, eligibility. Then there's also something called the special eligibility. And that is, that is, uh, uh, is the requirements the department puts forward on, on being a, study, uh, as a student in this particular subject. So if, if you, for instance, want to apply for this position in wireless energy efficient wireless systems, then the department can require that you need to have taken these courses in wireless networks or radio communication or something like that. So you need to have the specific prerequisites for, for this particular subject. Uh, you have to need a background in, in, uh, in, in a specific subject. So if, if you have taken a, um, a, uh, a, a, um, a master degree in uh, nanoelectronics or something like that, then you may not be eligible for a, a PhD uh, in software engineering. They say it's okay, you, don't, you haven't taken the basic courses in software engineering. Um, <clears throat> so these are the, the formal requirements. Um, and uh, when you get these applications, then people who don't, don't uh, fulfill the formal requ requirements are sorted out. And, and then uh, if you get 100 applications, then uh, 50 are sorted out because they don't fill the formal application. Then the other 50 that fulfill the formal application, what we look at is what we think is necessary to be a PhD And personally, and this then becomes a bit personal because who does the uh, selection here? And that's the advisor, basically. The main advisor that will become the main advisor, the project leader, makes the, in, in practice, the selection. You see down here, the main advisor proposes the candidate to be selected, and formally it's the dean of the school that makes the, uh, makes the decision, but it's, it's the advisor that makes the selection. An advisor, what does he look at? Um, of course, we have at KDH, I would say, in most of the subjects, we have a zero fail possibility, uh, a, a zero fail objective. So if we admit somebody, we, we're going to be sure that that person graduates, that that, that person had what it takes to become a student. So most, uh, in most cases, we uh, not only look at the application, we also interview people. And the best thing for us is if we actually have seen the people working. So if the, if the student has done a master project with, with our group, we know exactly if that person is suitable for, for a PhD or not. Or if he has done a master project somewhere else, you can actually see some proof of, uh, of the skills in, in doing independent research or doing a project on its own and showing uh, ability to, to work 
independent on its own. And that, that is really what, what we look for. So it's, I would say it's, it's um, analyt we call analytic ability. Uh, and analytic ability measuring rates. So if you have good rates, you should be, you're good at scoring high on exams, meaning that you probably have uh, good knowledge in, in, the, in the subject and uh, are able to, to solve problems. That, that, is, uh, that is one thing. The other thing is your interest for the field. If you're really motivated, if you really think this is the, the most fun thing in the world, you want, I want to study the subject, that's also your thing. Because um, I would say that the PhD, the PhD work you do at KTH has to be the uh, top quality in the world. And in your subject, the stuff that you publish, the stuff that you do, has to be top-notch quality in the world. You have to be the expert in the world on, on your subject. And this requires a lot of, lot of hard work. And if you, if you don't think it's fun, you're not going to do the work that is necessary. But that's simply history. And if, if you don't think it's fun, and if you don't think that you have the ability, and, and uh, then it's, it's no use of starting, because then you're wasting each other's time. So I think it's, and this is of course very hard to judge, because even you, if you're really interested, in, you, you, even for you it's difficult to judge if, you're, if you want to spend four years on, on this subject. It's, it's difficult to do. But I think the most important thing is that you want it yourself. If your parents want this, I don't think that's a good idea. I mean, it's, it's actually true. Some, some students actually come to me and say, I have to be a doctor because my, my father thinks. <laughs> he is a professor at the university there, there and, and, and uh, I can't go home without having a PhD. <laughs> I mean, there's this, this, uh, this situation. I, mean, I think that's, that's a really bad, bad situation because uh, if you don't think it's fun, if you don't think uh, it's really worth it, then, uh, then you're not going to put down all the work that's needed. So I don't know if I scare you off or I tease you. <laughs> Usually you say that you have to tell, tell the students about all the hardships and, and you can't do it and they really won't. <laughs> uh, then there are some formal requirements on the uh, admitting department as well. And that is that's, it's also good to know. Why, do, why don't they admit me as a PhD student? Um, that's the flip side of this uh, nice situation that we have with um, uh, that you get employed and you get all the social benefits uh, of an employment and you're, you become a government employee and everything like that. The flip side is, is that it's very expensive for the department. So the department uh, needs to come up uh, with a guarantee for financing for the duration of the program. And of course, if you don't graduate, we have a problem. So it's this why we are really keen on, on selecting people that we really think can do. Because it's both good for us. We don't waste our resources, and you don't waste your resources. It's something that is not going to work. So, um, so that's maybe the main hurdle that limits us. I think our department could probably admit uh, uh, twice as many PhD students if uh, it wasn't for the, the uh, financing. Also, there could be advisor capacity. In some fields that are very popular, there are many PhD students, and, and they may have lots of financing, but then uh, they, they, uh, they have too few advisors. And we have a limit on the number of advisors. So as a, as a director of graduate studies, I personally, I, I assign advisors, formally assign advisors. So, so I usually, I, I have to say stop if I see that this advisor has too many students, but the quality of the advising won't be good. So there has to be, uh, we have now a system where, where um, uh, an advisor cannot be, uh, the, um, the main advisor cannot be the main advisor for more than 10 students, and he cannot be the sole advisor for more than five. So normally it is a main advisor, and he has maybe a, a assistant advisor, which could be slightly, slightly junior, more junior research that can, can do the practical work. Um, to give you a little bit of hint on um, 
uh, what are the limiting factors? I'll give you some numbers here. Um, uh, a, um, we pay a student uh, during, the during this period of study, we pay him about a million kroner in salaries. Or, or we pay, uh, some of this is tax, of course, the student won't get, unfortunately, all of it, most of it is tax. <laughs> and um, we spend about 2 million kroner on, on uh, offices, administration, equipment, and everything around it. And then the advisor advising costs about a million kroner. So, so a student costs uh, 4 million kroner. So we have to find 4 million kroner somewhere from the research project or something to protect the students. And that's quite a lot of money. Uh, and, but KDH is. It's quite successful. That's why we have 150 students. There, there are 600 million kroners that uh, are invested in, in, in the students. It's, it's quite a lot of money. But KDH is quite successful in attracting this money. But this also means that this money is not just flowing at the regular pace. It really depends on where the funding agencies, uh, when they have funding available. Or, or what happens is that the different research groups, they apply for money. Uh, at Swedish uh, uh, Research Council, a very large portion now goes uh, of funding comes from the European Commission, European uh, Research Projects. Uh, and uh, when we are successful in, in securing a project, then suddenly there will be lots of announcements for for uh, PhD students and positions. But in the meantime, maybe we can have a year without any uh, meeting any students. So this is very irregular events these is when, when uh, we actually uh, recruit new, new teachers. So uh, <clears throat> that, that's a good thing to bear in mind. So when the opportunity comes, uh, there may be several opportunities open, but then it can take a very long time until there's a, there's a new opportunity. So um, then, of course, the big question, is it worth it? <laughs> Uh, spending four or five years of your, of your life doing this. Uh, and of course, there, there are two answers to this. It, it's of course, uh, uh, personally, uh, what kind of career do you have in mind? Uh, I would say that if you have an interest in, um, in uh, research and uh, in, 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 let's say, Swedish industry, uh, PhD students or PhD graduates are high in them. So they are Swedish industry, in particular the company I work a lot with, Ericsson, they really value PhD, PhDs. So they, they uh, I wouldn't say that they pay you uh, loads of money, but they, they give you uh, tasks and, and really interesting jobs where you can uh, have a lot of freedom to, to, to influence what, what the company is doing. So that, that's just really, from a career perspective, it, 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 it's a really uh, from a salary perspective, well, could be. Not, not, not so much in Sweden, but in other countries, it, it's uh, a big advantage on having a teacher. But it's also uh, from a personal perspective. I mean, I would say that most of the uh, students that I have, they, they don't do it for the money, but they do it for, for, for their career and for, for uh, um, getting uh, interesting jobs in, in, in the future. 